Wait, am I supposed to go ahead and start talking? Good afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, a primer on plant morphology with Dr. Michelle Bowe. My name is Haley and I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A section on your screen and at the end of the presentation, MPF Executive Director Carol David will read those out to Dr. Bo. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now I will give some background on Dr. Michelle Bo. Dr. Michelle Bo grew up in South Carolina where she explored the woods and meadows with her childhood best friend and became fascinated by all of the plant life around creeks and in the forest. In high school, she made a leaf collection that she still has and the species are still among those she currently teaches. She went to Wofford College in South Carolina as a biology major and fell in love with botany. She then pursued a PhD at Vanderbilt University studying seed plant evolution using molecular data and morphology. Her first faculty position soon followed at Frostburg State University in Maryland. And then in 2002, she moved to Springfield to teach at Missouri State University. Courses she's taught include plant taxonomy, identification of woody plants, vascular plant morphology, and applications of molecular techniques. We are excited to have Dr. Bo here today to learn more about plant morphology. And now we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Bo. Thank you. All right, thank you, Haley. Just let me know if, if, if I need to say anything again or, or if you can't hear me or anything like that. So um, one question that comes up is why even study the, all the terms that are associated with plants? And there are a lot of terms, <laughs> everything, all plants have descriptions in the in the keys and in their in the flora. Um, so, the, so the question is, why even learn all these words? And one way, one thing is just to communicate about plants. If you want to talk to somebody else about the plants, you might need to use a big word that that you maybe aren't they aren't familiar with. And you you want to know what that is, but you also need the terms to be able to key out the plants. So I'm gonna focus on terms that are those that are used to key out plants. And that's gonna be kind of the main focus. Now, one of the first things that you run into in either a key or a description of a plant is what is this habit? Its habit is basically how it grows. It's not like its habitat. It's not um, what it's doing exactly, although it sort of, sort of is, but is it herbaceous? Is it a woody plant? Is it succulent? Like is it thick and juicy? Does it have uh, spines or something like that? Is it floating in the water? Um, is it just a fern or, or a gymnosperm? Is it a flowering plant? What, what kind of plant is it? How, how often does it flower? If it is a flowering plant, is it annual or perennial? Um, so all of these categories are not really taxa, which means that they're not named groups necessarily, but they are kind of categories of plants that when you first look at a key, one of the first questions may be, is, is this an herbaceous plant or a woody plant? Okay. Now I'm gonna start with some very, very basic basic things. And so this is just a basic plant um, and it, it may look like a rose or something, but it's not. Um, but there are two, two kind of main parts of the plant, the shoot and the root. The shoot is the uh, above ground part. And so we're gonna focus on that and most of, because that's the part that you see most of the time. And the root is, of course, the underground part. Now, on a shoot, you have several different things. You have stems, which is what everything is attached to. And then you have leaves. And the leaves aren't just simple, like, oh, there's a leaf and that's the end of the story. There are um, two parts to a leaf, the blade, which is the, the flat part that's mostly photosynthetic, and the petiole. Now, where these things are attached is called a node. So I drew a line from 
one of the nodes here, but what's, what you want to see this, there's also, there's a leaf, but there's also a bud in the axle of the leaf and buds can grow into something else. So they will grow into either another shoot, another stem with a leaf on it, or they could grow into a flower. Now, and I'm gonna get into kind of the main terms associated with leaves. And so um, if we look at the, the average of like several different types of plants, you have, here's the stem, the leaf with the blade and the petiole, and then there's a bud in the axle of the leaf. And you can't see the bud in the axle of these leaves, but they're, they're there. Now, every now and then a leaf has an extra little appendage at the very base. And this is usually something found in certain plant families like the rosaceae, the, the rose family. And uh, this is called a stipule. This, is, this would be at the base of leaves, if, if it's even there. So that's just an extra, that's a bonus leaf type thing. Now, um, leaf arrangement, uh, we use two main words to describe leaf arrangement, and that's alternate and opposite. Opposite leaves are directly across from each other, like shown, as shown here. Alternate leaves, you have one leaf on one side of the stem, and then you go up a little ways, and then there's another leaf on the other side of the stem. Now, it, this gets confusing if the leaves are close together, but usually you can find some stem material with leaves that are spread apart. Now, if you do have three leaves attached to one place, that's called world, world. Now, um, there is another special case which is found only in, in herbaceous plants, and that is basil leaves. Well, basically only basil in herbaceous plants. So this is when the leaves are right at the base of the plant, and then there's maybe something like a, an inflorescence where the flower is coming up from the top of that. In this case, usually the leaves are gonna be alternate, if, they, if there was a stem, but since they're all at the base, we just say, use the word basin. Okay, now this slide is just showing simple leaves. So each leaf has one blade, but not all leaves are simple. So what we, um, the way we describe leaves by their complexity is that leaves are either simple with like the previous ones or Compound and compound leaves can be several types. And compound leaves have three components in addition to the leaflets. Well, they have the petiole, the middle part where the leaflets are attached is called the rachis, and then the leaflets. Now, if you have a pinnately compound leaf, you have one long axis that's the rachis and leaflets attached to that. So that's pinnately compound. If, if each leaflet is split again, like this one, this is a honey locust tree. There are, so there's a side rachises or rachili and leaf, little leaflets attached to that. That's called bipinnately compound. Now, in the case where leaflets are all attached at one point, like a hand, like, like the palm of your hand, it's called palmately compound. And then if there is a special case where you just have three leaflets, it's often just called trifoliate, um, just to indicate that there are three, exactly three leaflets. Now, I wanted to show a little bit about what this would look like with ver various types of leaf positions. So in this case, this lower picture shows two alternate leaves, but they're compound leaves. So the leaflets themselves may be opposite, but the leaves are alternate. And in this case, this is what opposite leaves would look like. This is like what you have in an ash tree. Now, another characteristic of leaves is what is on their margins. And we use a lot of words that have other meanings. So one of the words that has, has other meanings is the word entire. But for leaf margins, entire just means that there is no teeth, there are no teeth, there is no lobing. Um, basically, it's a smooth margin. So some other possibilities are undulate, which just means wavy, serrate, which just means sawtooth, doubly serrate, which means you have small um, teeth within larger teeth. Dentate, which means large, evenly spaced teeth. Crinate, which means weight of rounded teeth. And then we have things like lobed leaves, which were, are more indented. Pinnately lobed leaves are lobed along a long axis, whereas palmately lobed leaves are kind of like palmately compound leaves, that they're lobed along one center axis. And usually there are at least three lobes for a palmately lobed leaf. 
<laughs> no, um, I was in the description of this webinar it mentioned something about hair, and there are a lot of hairs on plants, and there are a lot of terms for hairs. So I'm just going to give you the basic, basic, some basic terms. That, these are ones that you would, are likely to see in the key. So hairs on a plant can be anywhere. They can be on the leaves. They can be on the stem, like in here. They can be on sepals, which is like right there. They can even be on the petals or on the stamens of the flower. The plants without hair are just said to be glabrous or, or just simply smooth. Plants with hair are said to be pubescent or hairy, or sometimes people just say uh, fuzzy or something like that, depending on how, how hairy it is. And the technical term for a plant hair is the trichome, but most people just say hair. If the plant has long, coarse hairs, it's said to be hirsute. If it's got stiff hairs like this picture that has some prickles in it, but it's got really stiff hairs, that's hispid. If the hairs are really woolly and long, they're said to be tomentose. If they're short, pubescent, short, um, rough feeling hairs, they're said to be scabrous. So basically that's a feeling, you feel the leaf and it feels scabrous. The stellate hairs are a special case of hair where the hairs are actually branched and look somewhat like stars, which is where the stellate word comes from. <clears throat> but um, those can be any kind of branched hairs where there's, and they're often more than one cell. Most, most of the time, cell uh, hairs are just one cell in size. Now, if you have a hair that might be um, either like secreting something or something like that, it may be glandular. And this picture shows some glandular hairs. So, so you can see kind of little balls on, on mixed in with the hairs. Those are just little beads of fluid. And a lot of times, glandular um, pubescence feels sticky to the touch. So this are, that's hispid and then glandular. Now, there are a lot of terms associated with stems in addition to just the ones with leaves. And um, so certain things are modified stems, like thorns, for example, are generally only gonna be on woody plants and they're gonna be modified stems. Prickles could be anywhere on the plant, pretty much, and including leaves, and, and they are part of the epidermis of the, of the plant, the skin of the plant. Something called spines, we call spines things that are modified leaves. So on a cactus, for example, it's, it's, you would say it's a succulent plant, it has a succulent habit and spines for leaves, and it doesn't have any flat leaf, leaf blades. Now, barberry has a spine down below this little Thing that was a bud and it's now a little short shoot um, and they are modified leaves that would otherwise look like leaves. Then another aspect of plants can or that some plants have and only vines have these are tendrils. Tendrils are curly. Um, you think of like a tendril of hair or something like that but those are just helping the vine to climb up whatever it's climbing up. Okay. So we are gonna talk about flowers now. So, so we just to mention what we already talked about, we talked about the, the non-reproductive parts of the plants first. Now we're gonna talk about the reproductive parts of the plants. Now this is a very idealized picture of a flower, but I do wanna just kind of um, say what the different parts of the flower are based on this idealized picture. So we have what are called pearls of flower parts. So in, they are in order, they're in a particular order. And we, so we call something a sepal or whatever based on what order it's in. And so just a couple of other terms, the, if there's a small flower attached to a stalk, the stalk can be called a pedicel. And we'll come back to that word in a little bit. Um, receptacle is where everything is attached. So all the flower parts per se are attached. So the first whorl of flower parts is sepals. And they're often green, but they don't have to be green. Something like a lily, for example, doesn't have green sepals. Um, then petals, petals can be a bright color like purple. Um, but they, they again, don't have to be a different color. They could be green or they could even be brown. Um, and then just above that are the stamens. And the stamens are the male part of the flower. And in this case, we have five stamens here. And um, they, they consist of an anther and a filament. The filament can have characteristics of its own, like it could be hairy or something like that, or it could be non-existent. You just, to, to have a flower, all you really need is either a stamen or a carpal in the female parts. 
So carpels are the fundamental female, female unit of the flower, and they consist of a stigma, which is where the pollen sticks and grows through the style down to the ovary where the ovules are. And that's where the seeds get pollinated and fertilized. And eventually this part grows into the fruit. So the four, four worlds of flower parts are just sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels. Now there was a question um, that came up on the, web, the webinar description too, which is what is a bract? So, so I do wanna mention what a bract is. So right now I didn't say anything about bracts, but if you have something extra below the sepals, that they're all, and it looks like a leaf or a petal or something like that is often called a bract. So probably the most famous bracts, especially in Missouri, where this is our state tree, is flowering dogwood bracts. And so flowering dogwood, all dogwoods flower. So why is this one called flowering dogwood? Well, it's called that because it's got these four very showy bracts that stand out and make it look like a big flower. But really, if you look closely at a flowering dogwood, what you're looking at is a bunch of little tiny flowers. Each flower has four little petals and four stamens and four sepals. Sepals are, are hidden, but, um, but they're basically green, little green flowers. But the bracts are what we see if, from a distance. Now, we think of flowers as being idealized like that previous one, which has both stamens and carpels. So it is what we call a perfect flower. And that means it's bisexual. So in flowers, perfect flowers have both male and female parts. But not all flowers have both male and female parts. So if they just have male parts, they're often called staminate flowers. These are things like oak catkins and things like that. And then if you just have female flowers, they're ca called either pistillate or carpellate, depending on the author. And these, these are both words for the female part of the flower. Now, if you have, so these are two imperfect types of flowers, uh, staminate, pistillate, and carpellate are, are um, what we call imperfect flowers. But if you have, so if you have staminate and carpellate flowers on the same plant, the plants are said to be monoecious. This is something like uh, cucurbitaceae, the cucumber family. They have monoecious flower, flowers, so each flower is one gender. Now, um, a lot of plant, or, and also things in the birch family. So we have, here we have male catkins and female catkins. This is a, a birch. Now, if you have different um, male, female, female flowers on different plants, that's said to be dioecious. So probably the most um, commonly known example of a dioecious plant is a holly plant. So here's a female. If it has fruit, then it's the female. If it doesn't have fruit, then you can't really say it because it either unless you have male flowers that either didn't have fruit because it's male or it's or it just didn't produce anything or you can't see it gone okay now uh, there are some other things that other words that we use that um, that mean have other meanings other than um, for botany but in, in botany we have the word distinct which means separate so um, if we have flowers like this one, the tulip poplar, that has a whole bunch of separate sepals and petals, and also separate stamens, and carpels for that matter, um, the parts are said to be distinct. Now, if you have parts that are fused, like in this case, you can still tell how many petals there are. I'm betting that everybody said, secretly said five to themselves here, saying there's five petals, even though it, if, you, if you blanked out all of the lines on the petals, it would just look like a circle. So if you have petals all connected like that, they're, they're said to be connate. So pretty much any part can be connate. So sepals can be connate, petals can be connate, stamens can be connate, um, and carpels are frequently connate. Now, if you have two different kinds of parts like the petals and the stamens connected to each other, then that's, the, we use the word adnate for that. So um, that's hard to picture on an actual like photograph or an image. So uh, I have a drawing here for that, showing that, that the anthers are attached on the inside of the floral tube. So, so a frequent um, description would be something like stamens and petals adnate. So basically any part can be connate, any, any two parts that are next to each other can be adnate, could be adnate, although I don't think that they all happen. <laughs> okay. 
So I just want to show you a couple of pictures of staminate flowers. So I used an example of oak, but these are basically, so even though these don't have any petals and they really don't have sepals either, it's just stamens. This is a flower, this is a flower. Um, and then carpolate flowers, here's a flower from a walnut. It has two stigmas and here's the ovary. And that's the whole flower right there. No, um, no real sepals and petals, although you might be able to make out some little tiny sepals. Okay. Now, um, another aspect of flowers is their symmetry. And um, I have to tell my students all the time that flowers aren't asymmetrical. They're either, <laughs> they're generally either radial, which is what is shown on this slide, or bilateral, which is kind of, which is, um, means that you can only draw one line of symmetry. In radially symmetrical, um, flowers, you can draw several lines of symmetry through the middle of the flower and still get uh, equal halves. So here's one with three petals. It doesn't matter how many petals they have, you can still be radial or um, bilateral. So here's one with four petals. You can draw many lines of symmetry and picture them um, two equal halves. And you can still, even if the petals are connected, you can tell that they that there are five of them. So I just uh, wanted to show the opposite of that, or basically the opposite for keying purposes, and that's bilateral flowers. Bilateral means you can only draw one line of symmetry, and most flowers that are bilateral are, are just, just bilateral, so you can only draw one line. So we have the stay flower here, and um, a member of the mint family here, you can draw one line down the middle. There's a couple of things in the, the papaveraceae, the poppy family, or fumaraceae, depending on who you ask, that are um, isobilateral, which means you can draw two lines of symmetry. You can draw a line of symmetry there. And then if you change the orientation of the flower, you can draw a line of symmetry in the other direction, but that's unusual. Now, another aspect of flowers and, um, is basically where the ovary is in relation to everything else on the flower. So if the ovary is attached above where the sepals and petals are attached, it's said to be superior. And that's true even if there is a hypantheum. So in this picture, this structure right here has a, is a cup-like structure where the sepals, petals, and stamens are attached on the margin of the cup. So this is a, it's called a hypantheum. And um, several families have hypantheum, but Rose family is the most notorious for having one. Um, notice that this ovary is still attached above where the hypantheum begins. So these are still superior ovaries. So, so an ovary is said to be superior if it's above where the sepals and petals attach. So the other possibility, the other main possibility is inferior. And this is if the ovary is below where the sepals and petals attach. So here's an example. The cucurbitaceae has um, flowers that are some, often still attached to the fruit when you first pick, pick them. Like in this case, so the flower is above where the, the ovary is, or the, the petals are above where the ovary is. And this one, you can see a swelling here below where these sepals are. And then on Ostromeria, you can see a swelling also below where the sepals are. It's still best to, to cut open the flower, or open up the flower and see, you know, is there an ovary inside there that's above where the, everything is attached? Okay, so when we look at flowers, we generally look at just one flower, but it's, it also can be important how the flowers are arranged. So flowers are arranged in what we call inflorescences. Now, um, earlier I said something about a pedicel being the stalk of a flower. Well, if you have a, a whole inflorescence where there is one main stalk and then, then flowers attached to that stalk, the stalk of the inflorescence is called a peduncle. And this, this can be uh, good to know because in keys, you might run into something like peduncle is hairy or peduncle is smooth or, or um, pedicel is longer than the sepals or something like that. So, so this is used often in keys for specific, to get to specific um, species of plants. Now, in the middle of the peduncle, where the flowers are attached, is also called the rachis. This is the same word that we use in leaves, where the leaflets are, leaflets are attached. 
So this one is called a spike. So in a spike, the flowers are sessile, which means they don't have their own little stalks, and they are directly attached to this long stem. Now this is a standard spike, uh, just a, a regular one. There are poss other possibilities, and one of them is a catkin. In catkins, it's basically the flowers are uh, directly attached to a long stem. And here we have female flowers and male flowers. Um, but in this case, catkins are, are reduced flowers where they're just one sex or the other. So they're just either male or female, so just male or female in this case. Um, and they're only in woody plants also. Now, if you extend, if you take a spike and then you add pedicels, the little leaf stalks or little uh, leaf stalks, little flower stalks to each flower, then that's called a racine. So each flower has a pedicel and a racine. There's one, one longitudinal uh, axis and then these little stalks, stalked flowers. In this case, these are stalked fruit. And then here's another one with a racine. So you have, here's the peduncle, the rachis, and then pedicels. Now, if you take a racine and you um, branch it out a lot, then you get what's called a panicle. So the definition of a panicle is basically a branched racine. Now there's some special types of inflorescences like umbels where all the pedicels arise from one point. So, and this is this is a simple umbel like what garlic or wild onion has, allium. And um, there's a little bract right here below all the flowers. And then each flower, each pedicel is about the same length in an umbel, usually. Now, if, if, if each pedicel is branched again into another set of little pedicels, um, then it's called a compound umbel. And that's what we have with Queen Anne's lace or um, wild carrot. Now, another special type of inflorescence is called a sign. And I'm just going to keep this simple with a simple sign here. Uh, and a simple sign is, is a very specific type of inflorescence where there are three flowers, and the center flower is the most mature flower. So it's older than these other two. And um, this is something you finally you find in the uh, Caryophyllaceae, the pink family, um, especially, which is what that one is. Um, but you can also have signs that are basically curved around because only the middle flower and the side, like this flower and this flower form, but this flower doesn't form. So this forms a curve and that's called a helicoid sign, sometimes called a scorpioid sign. Now another type of inflorescence that, um, that you can run into is if, if all the flowers are attached basically at one point and that's called a, a head. So this is when you have sessile flowers. A sessile means no pedicels on the flowers, but they're all attached to one point. So like Eryngium, which is a nice prairie plant, um, the rattlesnake, rattlesnake master. And then um, anything in the Asteraceae is also considered a head. But what you're looking at here is instead of petals and sepals and things like that, you're looking at a lot of flowers. So if we were to take this, flower, this inflorescence here, so this is the whole inflorescence, and take a longitudinal section cut across the middle of it, we would see something like this, where there's a bract there, and then what's called a ray flower, and then these flowers in the center are called disc flowers. Now, once we get, um, once your flower has matured, if you're if you're looking at a flower and it's it's gotten to become a mature flower, then it has what are called what's called fruit, um, which sounds like something like something that's harder than it is, but it's not. Um, so basically a fruit is a, a mature ovary. Only flowering plants have fruit. Things that have cones are, are not considered, um, those are not considered fruit. So something like a juniper, for example, um, even though we sometimes call them berries, they're not technically fruit, so they're not technically berries. So a mature ovary of a flower is a fruit. Okay. So, um, so there are several categories of fruit. Well, the first kind of split of fruit is whether the fruit are fleshy or dry. So we tend to think of fruit as being fleshy because we think of fruit as something that you eat. So um, something like a banana, for example, might be a fleshy fruit. Um, 
So if, if the fruit has more than one seed and is fleshy, it's generally called a berry. If a fruit just has one seed, it's sometimes called a stone fruit, but the word that is usually used is droop. Now, there are some specialized fruit out there that are specialized berries. So if you have um, a berry that doesn't really act, well, basically the ovary wall is not the outer part like that, then it might be something else. So for example, um, in the cucurbitaceae, the cucumber family, we have what are called pepos. And this is basically, it's, it's a berry, it's a modified berry with a thick rind that uh, comes from an inferior ovary. And it's only in the cucumber family. And then even though we don't have a lot of rutaceae in Missouri, we have a couple species of rutaceae, um, but citrus fruit are called Hesperidia, or has, one is a Hesperidium. And it has a thick outer rind that's oily, and then se sections inside that are juicy. And those, are, those juice glands are actually modified hairs or trichomes. Now, there's another category of fruit that's not really a category, but a, um, a descriptive kind of area, and that's accessory fruit. So um, a poem is one example of an accessory fruit. This is where you have a hypanthium. So if you remember that hypanthium from before, if that hypanthium were to, to get really fleshy and then fuse to the ovary, so in the case of a poem, the ovary is this middle part. And this, this part is the hypanthium. So the part that you eat, or the part that you would want to eat probably, is the hypanthium. So it's accessory to the fruit itself. So instead of saying this, this um, structure here is a fleshy hypanthium fused to a five-parted um, pericarp with five seeds or something like that, why don't we just say it's a poem? And so in a poem, you, poems always have some, something that we usually refer to as a core, and the core is the ovary itself. So fruit are defined by what the ovary wall is. And so um, even though we think of these kind of things as we think of fruits and nuts as two different things, nuts are actually a fruit type. So dried fruit, like those shown here, uh, are still fruit, <laughs> even though they're not, you know, we don't think of them that way usually. Um, but there are two ty types of dry fruit. There's indehiscent fruit, which are ones that have to be broken open somehow, either by like a squirrel or something like that, or a human right, with a nutcracker. Um, so indehiscent fruit don't open up by themselves. And usually they just have one seed. Now dehiscent fruit, like these shown here, um, do open up by themselves or have the ability to open up by themselves. Now, um, the two shown here are a nut and a, a winged akeen or a samarin. I'll come back to these. Now, the number of compartments that a fruit has, especially if it's an indehiscent fruit, um, will tell you more about what, what fruit type it is. And so, I mean, um, so, well, so this one is a capsule because it has six compartments, whereas this has just one compartment and it's a legume. So on this slide, um, if, if this were more interactive, I would ask you, what, what do all these fruits have in common? And um, so there's the question, what, what do all these fruits have in common? And so one thing that they all have in common is that they're all, they all have one seed. So this has one seed, this has one seed, this has one seed, there's a seed, and this, this is two fruit, but one seed each. So then the next question becomes, well, how, how are they different? Are all these different fruit types? And it turns out that these are all different fruit types. Well, not all different fruit types, but, but they're gonna differ based on how large it is for one thing. Is it, is it large and has a pretty uh, woody outer ovary wall, like a nut? Or is it smaller and you can uh, take the seed out like an akeen? Or is it a grain where you can't actually take the seed out from around the, um, from inside the ovary? Michelle, yes, we did have one question that's on yes. this topic. What what kind of um, fruit is a peanut? Oh, a peanut is a legume. But I mean, of of the um, is it dehiscent, indehiscent? Oh. 
Well, <laughs> that's um, that's probably a more complicated question than I know how to answer. Um, I would think that they're generally indehiscent, but they're still they're considered legumes. So legumes should be dehiscent, but peanuts are a special case where you have to dig them up to get them. So somebody something has to dig them up to for them to be opened up. So I would say they're indehiscent legumes. Thank you. That's kind of a contradiction. Good question, but one that I'm not sure I can answer correctly either. Okay. Uh, so on this slide, we have single seeded small fruit. And usually these are called achenes, although um, sometimes I'm, I'm told that this, that in the Asteraceae sunflower family, they're called Cypsellas, which is not a word that I'd heard before earlier this week. <laughs> But I'm going to call them the, the, uh, I'm going to call them achenes. So if you have one seed in the fruit and you can peel it away pretty easily, then usually that's called an achene. Now, if this if the achene has a wing on it, then it's called a samara. Now, in the case of a grain. Grains, if you, if you think about uh, whether you would ever peel a corn kernel. The answer is probably no, um, and that's because the pericarp or the outside of the ovary wall is fused to the seed inside. So, um, so you wouldn't peel these, and the seed doesn't come out on its own. And that's only going to be in the grass family, Poaceae. And a fancy name for a grain is caryopsis, but most people just say grain. <clears throat> now, sometimes fruit, especially dry fruit will split up into different um, individual units. And if they do that, then the fruit itself is called a, is called a schizocarp or a schizocarpic. It would be the adjective form of the word. And each individual unit is a mericarp. So in the case of maples, for example, they have two mericarps, which gives us a double samara. Geraniums are really fun plants to, to play with because if you tap the top of them, especially if you have, um, well, depending on the species of geranium, you can tap the top of it and it splits into five carps, five mericarps, um, <clears throat> rather suddenly sometimes. And then things in the Achaeaceae or the umble, umble family, the carrot family, have um, achenes that are mericarps that split into two. Now, in all these cases, the number of carpels equals the number of mericarps. So Acer has two carpels, um, geraniums have five, and this one has two. <clears throat> now, if we're looking at dehiscent fruit, which you know, I'm not exactly sure what peanuts are, <laughs> whether they're dehiscent or not, but we're going to put them in the category of legumes in any case. Um, dehiscent fruits release seeds after opening up, and if they have more than one compartment and true septa in between the compartments, then they're said to be capsules. So this is another word where you may you, you may take pills that are capsules, a capsule where there may be a spaceship that has a capsule on it. So a capsule is a, a general term, but in plants, it, it's a specific fruit type that's a dry fruit that opens up and releases seeds and has more than one compartment or section. Now there's a special case of capsules that um, is only found in the Brassicaceae, the mustard family. And that is something called a salique. And so leeks form from two carpels, but instead of having a regular uh, septum and opening from the bottom, they open from the top and this fault septum stays on the plant. So they open up and then th these the seeds will still fall out. So they are dehiscent, generally speaking, but, um, but they open from the top instead of from the bottom. And so leeks are long, thin, I think of them as sleek, long, thin fruit, and silicles are the other type that Brassicaceae you can have, and they're basically basically a type of silic where they're shorter and not more than four times longer than wide. So on this slide, we have um, some other things that have have something in common. One of the things that's probably not obvious that they have in common is that each of these comes from one carpal or one ovary. So this is a simple ovary. Now, that being said, milkweeds do usually, they start off with two of them, so they could be two per flower. But, um, but this is one, one ovary that opens up along one line, 
and legumes are ovaries that open that can open up along two lines. And legumes also have seeds in one row. So what these have in common is that they're they're just from one one simple ovary. Now, so what are they? Well, milkweeds have follicles, and so a simple ovary with it open along one line and release the seeds. And legumes are the other type of what single carpal fruit. Um, and they can open on two sides. And they usually flatten, well, not always, but usually flatten. And the seeds tend to be in one row. So usually you can pick them out because of that. Now, if you're getting dizzy looking at this picture, don't worry, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna reduce it here in a second. But what all these have in common. To me, if I look at them, I see a lot of things. And so, and that's because they have, this has a lot of seeds. This has a lot of little round structures. This has a lot of things sticking out. Um, so all of these have lots of their fruits with lots of carpels, uh, lots of individual um, ovaries. But they come from two different types of um, structures. So everything on this slide comes from one flower. So one strawberry comes from one flower. One blackberry comes from one flower, and one magnolia fruit comes from one magnolia flower. So they're called aggregate fruits. So aggregates are where you have an aggregate of something, something else. So in this case, these are droops or droplets. Sometimes they're called droplets because they're small, um, and they're an ag aggregated into this one unit. You can take off and you can eat it um, just as it is. Now. Um, Strawberries are aggregates of achene, so the fruit type itself is are the, the little seeds on the outside, or what look like seeds. Those are actually the fruit. So, so a strawberry, a strawberry is a pretty complicated fruit, even though we, we think of them as berries, but they're not technically berries, um, and neither are blackberries. But uh, what you're looking at is, like I said, an aggregate of achenes, um, but it's also an accessory fruit because the part that you eat, the part that you want to eat anyway, is this fleshy part here. And it's really the receptacle that's fleshy. It's not, it's not the ovary itself that's fleshy. So that's a strawberry. Blackberry is just a simple aggregate of, dro of droops. And pawpaw fruits are aggregates of berries. I don't have a picture of pawpaw in here, but um, magnolia is an interesting fruit too because it has an aggregate of follicles. So each, each of the fruit are dry. And they open up along one line, but the seeds that come out have a fleshy structure on them, and that's called an arrow. So it's an aggregate of follicles, but each seed has an arrow. So that's another term there, arrow. So arrow is usually a reward for um, something that's going to spread the seeds around, like an animal, usually. Okay. Now this slide, these are all multiple fruits. So these come from many flowers, multiple flowers. and um, Pineapple is kind of a, an odd fruit because it's it's one that's basically sterile, um, and you can you can cut off the top of a pineapple and grow it again and grow if you wait long enough you'll get another pineapple. Um, but back back before humans messed with them, these were all separate flowers, and they were each berries and they fused together. So once you have all these berries fused together, then it gives you this big structure that we call a pineapple, um, and it is a multiple fruit. Mulberries are another example. Mulberries look a lot like blackberries or raspberries, but each unit, instead of coming from one flower, each, the whole thing coming from one flower, each unit here is its own flower. And you can see two little style branches sticking out of each um, of this mulberry fruit. Sweet gum is also a multiple fruit. And it's it's unique in several aspects because first of all, well, actually this is true for mulberry too. They they come from female flowers, so this is only from female flowers, and the male flowers are in a separate structure. Um, but each unit that makes up a sweet gum is a capsule, and it has two compartments inside there, so they'll open up and release release the seeds. Um, but there, that comes from from many flowers, many female flowers. Okay, I'm going to stop there and take any questions. And now I talked fast, so uh, I wasn't sure how long this would take. So, <laughs> so I'm sorry. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. That's a lot of information <laughs> to yeah. streamline into um, a fairly brief presentation. And I thought it was a great idea you had to focus on 
terms that one might encounter with keys. Um, there's one question that right away, um, Doug had a question about if a flower is a four or five part flower, that is if it has four or five um, petals, will it also have, is that the same, tr is that true that all other parts of the flower will be four or five? Like for example, no. it wouldn't have four or five bracts? <laughs> Uh, no, not necessarily. Now, bracts are, are, are different because, um, well, no, there are, there are dogwoods with five bracts, but each flower only has four petals, as far, I think. Or sepals, um, would the sepals be the same? Sepals and petals. So, so se sepals are usually green and then petals mm -hmm. are, um, a different color often. So I, I can give you some examples of ones that have different numbers of sepals and petals. So um, blooming right now is Spring Beauty. It has what appear to be two sepals, but it has five petals. And uh, another one blooming right now is Veronica or Speedwell. And those have four petals, but two stamens. Mm -hmm. And um, another example of four petals and two stamens are anything in the olive family, Oleaceae. So Forsythia, for example, would have four, it would have four sepals, four petals, and um, two stamens. So um, it's usually the case where sepals and petals are the same number, and bracts uh, just depends on whether they're, they're even present. They're, bracts are not present in every flower. Anyway. Thank you. And um, I want to let everybody know that um, in two weeks, Dr. Bo is going to give another webinar for us on how plants function, um, plant physiology, and um, of course, the structures and how they how they appear plays a role in their function. So um, look forward to that. There is a, a question here from Judy. She asks, could you go back to the picture of the sleek and show which part is attached to the rest of the plant? Okay. So if we look at this structure, this this stem is a the racine that has silicles which are just a type of silique. So you have the rachis here. The, this is a pedicel right there. And then the silique or silicle is attached to the pedicel. Does that answer the question? Um, it does to me, but um, I, but I hadn't, uh, on, the, on the other photo um, where you have the two, where would the, um, where would that silique be oh. attached to the rest oh, of oh, it? Oh, where would this, it would be attached down here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So this is the top of the fruit. This is this is where it's attached to the stem. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> uh, it's displaced out of it. Um, and and as you said, even though you covered a lot of material, you still presented just a subset of what's of, of right. all the uh, structures. Um, if people want to learn more, um, what are some references that you would recommend? Oh, <laughs> um. Well, books or websites or yeah i'm trying to, i have a good book that i use that's um of course i'm going to blank on what it <laughs> what the title is and, since i'm being asked but um there are most flora books have glossaries that have pretty good descriptions of what the fruits and everything is and that most flora books also have a, a pictures at the beginning that show things like hairs and leaf types and things like that so um, I would say just pretty much any flora. And I mean, these days with Google, you, now you have to be a little bit careful because you can end up with getting wrong answers of stuff. But um, there, let's see, there's a website called New England Botany. That's a pretty good site. It has keys, two things, and, um, and descriptions, I think, in addition to the keys and the species. There's also Virginia Tech Dendrology, which is a website that has all the woody plants in in the well in the country at least. Um, those are the things I can come up with off the top of my head. But most floras do have a glossary, and Thank unfortunately, you. I'm not sure about Missouri. <laughs> Flora, Missouri. I'm gonna have to check that. Thank you, and I I'll also note that we do have a a glossary. Um, on the Grow Native website, it it doesn't go into yeah. as much detail as as um, I'm sure these references do, 
but uh, we can share a link to that and a link to these other resources that you've mentioned in an email that will go out to all the registrants um, uh, uh, tomorrow. Oh, there is one other question. Can you define an arrow again? Yeah, so an arrow is a structure that's um, part of the seed. It's basically an add-on to a seed and it can cover the whole seeds, like the ones in Magnolia. Um, so, so here, the red things here are seeds themselves and they're coming out of the fruit. Um, and there's this extra structure. So basically the idea is that an animal would say, oh, look, there's something to eat there. And it would eat the arrow and then either spit out the seed or poop out the seed or something like that. Um, but it's it's an so basically it's a reward for something that's going to spread the the seeds around that's attached directly to a seed, fleshy something fleshy. I think it, do po pomegranates those are arrows is that correct? They are close enough to arrows that we could call them arrows. <laughs> <laughs> There's something called a it's called a sarcotesta, but oh. exactly the difference uh, between an arrow and a sarcotesta, uh, yeah. That's sorry. one of those technical, very technical differences. <laughs> sorry, I, I sorry I mentioned it. <laughs> no, that's okay. No, I mean, we might as well call them arrows. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, thank you very, very much, Dr. Bo, for taking time. I'm sure you're very busy with your teaching schedule. So we are super appreciative that you took time to share this fascinating and very useful information to us. And it's really fun to think about um, that we'll be seeing a lot of these plants blooming very soon and we yeah. can quiz ourselves on these terms. <laughs> so we look forward to seeing you in two weeks for plant physiology. Um, so thank you very much and thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, and one other thing I'll mention is uh, something else that is going on now that you may want to um, take part in is the Partners for Native Landscaping um, St. Louis Partners for Native Landscaping has a number of, of webinars uh, taking place, and you can find information on our website about that that are um, available to anybody. All right. Thanks very much, and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.